Okay, I think I'm actually live and it looks like sound is uh, happening through my, let me get this out of the way. So, watch what I'm saying right now, so I'll get rid of that. Okay, so you can see I'm uh, playing a little bit and uh, experimenting. figured I would try doing it this way rather than taking all the time to uh, make a video. And what is it that I'm doing? I'm going to start reading from this book. Sharing some of the research. Let's see here. It's got a PowerPoint started. We have the determination of the figure of the Earth from arc measurements by Arthur D. Butterfield. This book was written in 1906. Preface. This book is to give a brief historical outline of the work done in ancient and modern times. Keep in mind that's uh, 1906. To determine the figure of the Earth from the measurement of meridian arcs. Gathered are intended to show the progress and development of the work, thus enabling one to obtain a comprehensive idea of what has been accomplished in the subject and to note the progress in methods attained. You'll see as we go through this book, um, they definitely improve, and certainly the instrumentation improves. The results of the early investigators are given at full length, for ordinarily their reports are not accessible. Those of later investigators, the results of whom can be found in most libraries, are more condensed. Of the theory of the figure of the earth and methods of determination of its form from given data, only so much is given to the discussions of this paper. Like in other words, I don't think he goes into uh, what they actually ate making up those mountains. Um, few direct references have been made, but the subject matter has been obtained from the original reports in nearly all cases since the time of Norwood. So we're going to take a look at Norwood. I think he's around 17... I forget. At the close of the book, there is given a list of references and works consulted. Where allusions in the text are made to the reference books, they occur in the following form, parentheses, item number 12, page 92. Arthur D. Butterfield, Burlington, Vermont, March 20th, 1906. You're going to see uh, throughout the book, the toys is uh, mentioned a lot, and I thought it would be helpful to include the definition of the ears and feet. So you have an idea. I think that's the end of what I've prepared so far. This is not, again, this is like a test run. What I really want to do is gain a little more comfort in. Uh, coming online like this, got very excited by uh, some of the things I came across just looking up names, instrumentation. <laughs> you know, a lot of these are mentioned in the book and described. 
so I wanted to actually see, well, what, what does that thing actually look like? Oh, you're going to see descriptions of things called quadrants and sectors. They're quite large, 10 foot diameter arc measuring devices. They do a lot of astronomy in the book. I love this stuff. Uh, came across this. This this like this is very interesting. The UNESCO. They've actually uh, it's a world heritage of the Struve geodetic arc, and that's the one that goes up through in through um, Europe. And, you know, the other expedition was sent to Peru. You know, that's also in the book, but this is a treasure trove right here of what's looking, isn't it? <laughs> this uh, paper here is, oh, there's uh, Struve himself. I'll just fly down through here a little bit. This is interesting. I think what they are doing in this UNESCO thing is uh, certain locations to be uh, memorialized or um, world heritage sites, as they call them. This might be actually more interesting than uh, than uh, the other book. <laughs> The Butterfield book. I get, I'm getting, just like glancing through this, I think they've put plaques at filled with this out and read it. This thing here is I think done my research for me. If you look at this, I'm getting the sense that they've gone to each of these triangulation stations. Oh my God, this is great. So, uh, pretty cool. I don't know how much more I want to do this morning. This is just, uh, again, just me playing with the live Hangout method. If I can get comfortable with this and uh, and, and learn how to do it correctly, um, it might produce this thing faster. Uh, all the time to make videos. I think I'll just uh, end it right there. Oh, you know what I'll do? I'll, I will maybe just read a little bit and get some feedback. Uh, and also, if other people listening are interested in all of this information and have other sources, you know, please share it. Uh, I, I want to get better at doing this and do the Lapland expedition. This is all very interesting, this stuff here. Well, if I come across Norwood. Norwood. During the years 1633 to 1635, Richard Norwood, an Englishman, made an arc measurement between London and York. The results, according to the author's preface, were written up in 1636. Title of The Seaman's Practice, of which there were several editions. His method of work is shown by the following quotations taken from the edition of 1689. Quoting, upon the 11th of June, 1635, I made an observation near the middle of the city of York of the meridian altitude of the sun of a sextant of more than five feet, five foot diameter, semi-diameter, and found the apparent altitude of the sun that day at noon to be 59 degrees, 33 minutes. I also formally, upon the 11th of June, anno 1633, observed in the city of London, 
near the tower, the apparent meridian altitude of the sun and found the same to be 62 degrees one minute. And seeing the sun's declination upon the 11th day of June, 1635, and upon the 6th day of June, 1633, was one and the same without any sensible difference. Altitudes differ but little. We shall not need to make any alteration or allowance in respect of declination, refraction, or parallax. I'll just jump down here. I like this one. Yet, having made observations at York as aforesaid, for the most part, the way from thence to London, not I paced. <laughs> paced. Wherein, though custom, I usually came very near to truth, observing all the way as I came with a circumferner, circumferniter, all the principal angles of positions for windings of the way with convenient allowance for other lesser windings, ascents and descents, not down by a protractor after the usual manner, but framed a table much more exact and fit for this purpose after shoe. So that, uh, so that I may affirm the experiment to be near the truth. From this experiment, Norwood found the length of one degree to be 369,196 feet, or he rounds off to 367200. Round numbers. From the quotation, it is noted that he does not say whether he used the same instrument for observing at London as at York. But he seems to lay particular stress on the fact that the observations were made on the same day of the month. Inclination was practically the same. So on and so forth. Here we have a table of comparisons of uh, some measurement. You can really, oh my God, delve into this stuff. I want to jump down to the Lapland and Peru. Here's the Cassini's time that they were, the earth was prolate rather than oblate, which then became the, the, uh, the controversy to even launch such an expedition to send one party and, and the other to Peru. Well, here's the Lapland Ark. To settle this question of whether the earth was oblate or prolate spheroid, the Royal Academy of France, which thus far had been leading spirit in arc measurements, suggested that measurements be made under varying latitudes as possible. As a result of this suggestion, the Academy was requested by the King to undertake such measurements. Accordingly, two expeditions were sent forth, one to Peru and one to Lapland described the Lapland expedition, for although it did not start for nearly a year after the Peru party, first to return and make known its results. It goes on to describe uh, who goes on these journeys. And I, I, I would like to just look these people up individually. Um, The, uh, the book goes on to describe, measured the lengths using these bars or, or um, wood poles uh, in the units of these toys. This is interesting here. A reconnaissance showed them that their proposed plan was not feasible. They thought they were gonna use these islands but it turns out the islands had no height. You need some height to do triangulation. You've got to be up higher to see further. From inquiry and investigation, they found that the river Tornio ran almost due south and that the mountains on either side might afford a scheme of triangulation. Triangulation must be adopted or they must go south to some favorable point in Sweden. 
it was decided to attempt it, not knowing whether it would be possible to establish a good system or to measure a baseline that would connect satisfactorily. Okay, so for triangulation, you have to have a baseline. Or in other words, you can measure all the triangles you want at a length somewhere, you can't determine the lengths of all the rest of the lines. And so you'll see in some of these diagrams, the, uh, the triangulation scheme has to incorporate a baseline where you literally measure the length end to end. Uh, you know, we have it easy today with electronic measuring equipment, but uh, back then you had to measure it with some type of poles or rods or Later, we, you know, later on, we had tapes, steel tapes. But this is way, way back. So the difficulties they encountered were enough to stop the work of any, but those filled with an enthusiastic spirit of scientific investigation. For the conveniences, they had none. Tons affording poor lodging or poor fare. I mean, think about it. That's a one or two sentences that gives you a picture of people suffering. I mean, for conveniences, they had none. It's affording poor lodging or poor fare. The mountains were steep, wooded, and difficult to ascend, while the rivers and streams traversed were filled with rocks and rapids. Prevailing fogs delayed them sometimes for a week, Cats, which appeared in swarms, formed an intolerable, intolerable pest that only way to be free from them was to stick in a thick smudge of smoke or cover one's face and hands with pitch. Wow. With the assistance of soldiers stationed near and with the services of natives, they were able to conquer all of these difficulties. They divided up the work, some making reconnaissance. That, that means looking ahead, going forward, and finding a path uh, that they can pursue. Others erecting signals, and the signal is the target. It's something to be able to see through the telescope. And still others ascertaining the direction of the lines. That would be the observers. With the assistance of the soldiers, the mountaintops were cleared of timber and the signals erected. These were made by joining together in the form of a large hollow cone, a number of trees peeled of their bark and left white, thus making the signal that was plainly visible. On, were made on the rocks or stakes driven at the center of the signals located from these, so that in case of accident, might be recovered. Let me pause here and see what's going on, possibly in the ch chat, maybe. I don't know how to check the chat. <laughs> oh, whatever. I'm having fun. Hopefully, you are too. Let me shut this off. Uh, that PowerPoint needs some slides. Uh, let's see. Oh. Come on there. There we go. Let me jump down to the instruments. Oh, I wanted to mention there's, there is a place in the book where they forgot to measure Uh, descending, realizing, oh crap, we've got to go back up there. I, I want to one of these times find that page. I mean, it's happened to me. I mean, uh, there's times you'll you'll go out and you think you've got it all, and even then realize, oh shoot, we forgot to measure that, <laughs> and you have to go back. Uh, instruments. The angles were measured by a quadrant two feet in radius, 
provided with a micrometer. A microscope looking at a very fine graduated scale. Verifications of the quadrant were made by taking the angles around the horizon and the result always came very close to four right triangles. In observing the angles, the quadrant was always placed over the center of the station, or wrote down his observations separately. Afterwards, they were compared and the mean taken, you know, the average. They differed very little. Also on every mountain, they were very careful to observe the elevation and depression of all the signals between which angles were taken. And the reduction of the angles to the level of the horizon was worked out on the mountains before leaving the stations. Mind you, this is without calculators. <laughs> Stuff interests me to like want to look at those field notes. Do we do they have them stored somewhere? Can we actually go and look at the original observations? That would be very interesting. All three angles of each triangle were observed angles, which their sum or difference would give checks on the work. The sum of all the angles of the triangles amounted to nearly two seconds, more than the required number of right angles. Upon by, I'm gonna butcher this, Malpertuis, as agreeing with theory, this seems to be the first recognition of spherical excess. The reconnaissance, erection of signals, and taking of angles accomplished in 63 days. The astronomical work. Upon the astronomical work, starting first at Mount Kittis, which was, you know, I want to, this would be where I would probably Mount Kittises, but I thought I'd have a lot of research to do, but it seems that the UNESCO <laughs> has done it for me. So I'm going to maybe take a look at that paper and then interleaf uh, these, you know, with the PowerPoint. That would be cool. Or I guess I could just read that UNESCO paper. <laughs> All right. Though so I like the way this is written. So they start at Mount Kittis, which was their most northern point, September 9th, and having bought from a native a building, they proceeded to take it down to the top of the mountain, erected two observatories there. <sighs> to Home Depot and just buying <laughs> your building materials. <clears throat> The smaller observatory was built on the site of the signal and contained a clock, the quadrant previously described, and a small transit instrument with a telescope of 15 inches in length. This transit instru instrument, made by Graham of London, was placed directly over the spot which was the center of the signal and was used for obtaining the direction of the triangles with the meridian, the azimuths, of the lines of triangle of a triangle at Kittis. The larger observatory, situated so near that the clock beats in a similar in the smaller observatory could be counted, contained the large zenith sector. Graham. So, you know, I want to go look at that picture of what that thing looked like. The sector. Oh page uh, uh, citation number 15 page 6 that's at the uh, quote consisted of a brass telescope nine feet in length forming the radius of an arc of five degrees 30 minutes divided into spaces of seven minutes 30 seconds the telescope the center from which the plumb line was hung and divided and the divided limb were all in one piece, the whole being suspended by two cylindrical pivots, which allowed it to swing like a pendulum in the plane of the meridian. One of these pivots 
ended in a small, in a very small cylinder at the exact center of the divided limb and at its plane formed the suspension axis of the plumb line and so on and so forth. Observations were commenced and etc. So anyway, this is just a test run. Um, I'm going to have to read through this. Now i got to figure out how to uh, maybe say goodbye. The broadcast, anyway, uh, shoot, I wish I knew how to. How to, eh, I'll learn. I'll stop. Hey, uh. And you see where I'm going with this. Hopefully, uh, I'll make improvements to this. I, I know it's got some uh, improving to do. So, But uh, more, more of the case, I just wanted to see if there was interest in this. Um, and I'll take any suggestions and ideas that people might have and try to make this uh, something. Uh, all right. Have a good day. I'll stop the broadcast.